So, we're looking at 1 Timothy. Last week we started with 1 Timothy 1, and Paul began by addressing the reason Tim wrote. Tim wanted to hit the road, keep on moving, and Paul told him, no, son, you've got to buckle down, you've got to get to work. This is, this is what you're going to do. You've got to focus on the church in front of you, on keeping the leadership together. And so in, in 1 Timothy 2, uh, we start to hear Paul addressing the, the situation of, of the church. He's writing that, I urge that supplications and prayers, intercessions and thanksgiving be made for everyone. Kings, those in high positions, everyone. So that it is right and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires everyone to be saved. For there is one God and one people. This is, makes sense for Paul to write. He's writing in the, the early 60s AD. There, the persecution of Christians has not begun. And so you can write this, that we, we need to hold together and pray for this peace to continue. He also uh, has to say this, because the struggles uh, that uh, they're dealing with the Ephesus, that Timothy is dealing with with the split leadership, is that some people are teaching that not all people are, are worthy of getting the knowledge of Jesus. And, and so it, for Paul to be say very clearly, everyone, 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 all. God created all people. Like this is an important message for him to say uh, so that Timothy can point back to this, can read it to the church whenever they, they're are struggling with this to reinforce that we are here for all people. And then Paul moves on to what could get in the way of this. Because they're, they're living in a community, and, and how the community sees them matters. And, and so first he addresses men. He says, men, pray with arms out. This is how you prayed in the first century with your arms out, which I think is a great idea, because who's going to give a really long prayer if your arms are held out? Exactly. And pray without getting involved with anger or fighting. You know what drives people off from a church quicker than anything? Anger and fighting in the church. Right? You can disagree, you handle disagreements, but when it breaks out with like anger and fighting, people leave. And it was true then, it's true today. And so the first risk is you've got to make sure, men, stop your bickering. Second, women. Women should dress themselves modestly and decently in suitable clothing, not with their hair braided, with gold, pearls, expensive clothing, but with good works, as is proper for women who profess reverence for God. Let a woman learn and silence with full submission. I permit no woman to teach and have authority over a man. She is to keep silent. So Paul is asking the women of Ephesus to dress modestly. Okay, right? but don't, don't flaunt anything. Let's not wear lots of jewelry or bikinis to a church. I think that's fairly obvious. Please don't. Uh, receive instruction with submission. Like if you have a question during the sermon, that's great. But don't yell at me in the middle of it, please. Raise your hand. Just don't start yelling, please. Uh, then he gets into do not teach men and be silent. Well, that's fun. And, and what do we do with passages like this? The two approaches that tend to happen are, one, we say this is the word of God for us, the people of God. Don't you take the word of God seriously? It says women should not talk in church. So this is a room in which women will never speak ever again. That's it. We're done, right? That's one approach to such passages. The other, which we're obviously not going to take, uh, the other approach is to say, well, Paul is obviously a sexist pig, and we'll just ignore that, right? We'll just go through scripture and anything like this that just rubs us the wrong way this badly, we're just gonna get our scissors, cut it out, and be done with it, right? I like neither of these options, because to me they seem like flip sides of the same wrong coin. Both approaches take scripture to be flat, every verse to be equally authoritative, and set up scripture as a series of easy to interpret, simple to apply commands, like instructions to setting the time on your VCR. Just, well, simple-ish, right? And then we either choose to follow all of scripture, which then hits major roadblocks, because long before we get to women speaking in church, we have a whole set of other problems if you try to apply, if we try to apply all of the Bible just evenly and, and um, literally. Or if we go through and we start cutting out what we don't like and tossing it, 
Who is in charge then, right? If this is the word of God for us, the people of God, for us to say, but, if, but it's only the word of God if I say it is, that, that's arrogance on a level that is impressive, right? So there's got to be another way, and, and I think there is a better way, and it starts by asking a question that is deceptively simple. What is the Bible? Like this, when you hold a Bible, what are you holding? It's not a monolith. It's not like a brick building that's been put together with every verse being stacked together to make one coherent block that is coherent and integrated and doesn't conflict and it's all just perfect, right? That's not what it is. It is the record of God and God's people together. Fundamentally, the Bible is the record of God and God's people together, and it follows God's continuous efforts towards the goal of redeeming all of creation, making things all th making all things new and right. And so, God is perfect in this story, and the people of the Bible are profoundly not. And the imperfect people are the ones who held the pen, and that matters. The Bible is inspired in that it takes its inspiration from the story of a perfect God, but it is, the story of Scripture is limited by the people who tell it, because they don't always agree, and they have a lot of history to cover. 2,000 years of history covered from the beginning of Scripture to the end. Like, that's a huge chunk of Scripture, a huge chunk of time. And so... In Scripture, we see people growing in their understanding, and we see it from simple things like, how is God referred to? In the beginning of Scripture, we see God referred to as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Why? Because there's a whole bunch of gods, and if I say, well, let's talk about gods, you have to specify, well, the God of the Egyptians, or which God? Ah, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That God, right? And, and so you go down, the, you go further into Scripture, and you get to Isaiah, and you get to Isaiah saying, there is only one God, for there's only one creation, and all those other chunks of wood that people worship, they're, they're that, they're, they're chunks of wood. And then you get to the New Testament, where we see God sending his only begotten Son and so we see, if we see a son, there must be a father, and there's a spirit moving around. And so the name of God grows. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the one and only God, to God known as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And so this story of the Bible tells us more over time. The story of the Bible is not a set of bricks that build a wall such that if we question any part of it, you take, you're taking a brick out and the whole wall falls down. The Bible is the record of a, of a journey of people following a perfect God towards the kingdom of God. And we are people on this journey. And if we question and probe and ponder and struggle and argue with the scripture, A, that's what scripture does with itself. And B, that's part of course correction on our own journeys following Jesus. There have been major disagreements recorded in scripture amongst itself. Major changes that have occurred over time. If you look at Peter, like Peter, the Apostle Peter, when he starts out leading the church, he would have said to a Gentile, if, if any of you had come up to Peter, you're a Gentile. Anyone here Jewish? Right? You're all Gentiles, right? And so if any of you had come up to Peter and could speak ancient Greek and ask, can I follow Jesus? He would have given you a copy of the, the, what we call the Old Testament and said, there are 613 laws, start studying. Right? This is what you got to do to follow Jesus. you got to become Jewish to be able to follow Jesus because Jesus is a Jew. That's where Peter starts. But if you follow his development through Acts, by the time he gets to Acts 15, what he says is, don't eat anything that's marinated in its own blood. Don't eat anything that has been sacrificed to a false god. And keep your pants on when you need to. And then you can follow Jesus. There are your bases, right? Peter has grown quite a bit from 613 to 3. Right? That's quite the transition over time. He, he grow, he's growing up. He's learning. He's maturing. He, he keeps on learning. It's the same thing that happens when it looks at like violence. If you look across, it's not just individual people, it's entire peoples. If you look back to the beginning of Scripture, the way that violence is handled is you can use the arts of war if God lets you, right? And then you can't keep any of the spoils. You've got to destroy it all. Under the ban is what it's called. And then you get to this point, because what had come before was 
First, before the worship of God, it was just violence as much as you want. And then it was restrained violence. And then you get the prophet Isaiah saying a prince of peace is coming. And then you get Jesus showing up who says, stand up for yourself, turn the other cheek. Which is a way of saying, like, stand up for yourself. Don't hit the person back, but stand up for yourself. And so there's this development over time, which doesn't mean that this was wrong. It just means that the people grew in their understanding. You can't jump straight to calculus. you got to start with algebra, that theory of learning. And so with that in mind, when we get these passages of scriptures that make us go, huh? Really? All right. First, the way we handle them, in my opinion, is first we understand them in their individual context, and then you look for the story that they sit in. And so the individual context here with Timothy as a leader in Ephesus is that there are some serious disagreements going on in the church about what should be taught and who should be doing the teaching. Excuse me. What a good Bible, what a good study Bible would point out is that the teachers that Timothy needs to be bring back in line are focusing on the idea that only some deserve to have the knowledge of who Jesus is. And so here in the second chapter, Paul is responding, establishing that Jesus is not just for some people, but Jesus is for all people, and telling them that they need to be praying for all people, not just the ones who are worthy. This is the mission-critical thing that if the church cannot get right, it will not continue. But this is the most important thing. The church is for everyone. And so while Paul is doing this, giving this advice... He is giving them, giving Timothy some practical advice about how to handle that moment, that relationship in that community. Men, let's not get angry and divisive, right? Pray like the people around you. That's how you'll fit in best with the community. And women, dress decent. Don't flaunt your wealth. And what he says next is in the context of the Jewish people, Jews of the time, in this middle first century, would tell you, and I quote, it is better to burn Torah than to teach it to women. Right, that, that's sort of the Jewish stance of the time on women and, and education and women in scripture. It is better to burn the most sacred thing we have, the Torah, than to give it to a woman. It's a hot topic, right? And so Paul then makes this argument based upon a reading of Genesis that I just... I don't think it stands up. What he says is, Adam was formed first, then Eve. Adam was not deceived, but a woman was. Listen to what Genesis actually says. God created humanity in his image. In the image of God, he created them. All of them. Right? Male and female, he created them. God created humanity, all of them, plural, male and female, the two halves of, of humanity he created then. Who was created first? Humanity, right? There's not an ordering of male or female, it's just humanity is created, male and female, two halves of, of the species. And, and then if you go into Genesis 2, this might be the most problematic mistranslation in all of Scripture, in my opinion. It says, the word, when it says Adam was asleep and his a rib was taken, the word in Hebrew for rib literally is side. One side. Like one half, which kind of lines up with what I just said from Genesis 1. Right? And so, again, who was created first? Humanity. Two halves, male and female. And then it talks about, well, and women was, a woman was the one who transgressed and was deceived. Read it real close, and you're going to ask, where was Adam in this? He was right there. Right? And so if she's the one reaching out for the apple, you know what he was doing? Watching her do it. Right? This is like going and buying a car that you really shouldn't buy and one person, one person signing for it while the spouse sits right there at the desk. Whose fault is that? Well, whose line is on the paper, but really both y'all, right? I think Adam and Eve together, right? Marriage, isn't it great? So, I just don't agree with how Paul reads Genesis. I, I disagree with it, right? Uh, that's not how it makes sense to me reading it. 
Now, if that's the context in 1 Timothy 2, let's take a step back and see how Paul handles this in the wider context. To the church at Galatia, Paul has written, as many, as, you were ba- as many of you as were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. Because of this, there is no longer Jew or Greek, slave or free, male or female. You are all one in Christ Jesus. Right? This argument that being in Christ matters more than your ethnicity, your class, and your gender. Being in Christ is what matters the most. Paul then talks to the church at Corinth, and he tells them, you are all in the body of Christ, each and every one of you. Each and every one of you has skills. He doesn't say, men, you have skills, and women, well... Thank you for bringing lunch. He says all of you have skills. All of you have God-given gifts. This is something that Paul comes back to in Colossians, writing how we have to get rid of things like anger and wrath and malice, not lying to ourselves, because we have been clothed with a new self. And in this renewal, there is no longer Greek or Jew, circumcised, uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, or free. Again, this language that we are all one in this together. Paul is working, his theory, like his understanding, is that we are all in this together and being in Christ is what matters most. And then when he writes to individual churches, he's triaging the most important thing to handle first. And and so to Ephesus and 1 Timothy, he's telling them, you've got to be able to get along with your community because you've got to be able to focus on what matters most, that you are for all people. And, And then in Corinth... If you ever want to read about a church that's having a bad day, read Corinthians, right? And to Corinth, he does write in Corinthians 11, uh, women can pray in public, but in 1 Corinthians 14, women should not speak in the church. So, keeping all this context in mind, let me tell you the last chapter we have that Paul ever wrote. Romans. Every other letter that Paul writes, he writes to a church that's in the middle of problems. Romans, he writes because he's not going to be, he's worried he's not going to be able to get there. And so he's not writing to a church in crisis. He's not having to triage what's most important. He's just writing what he believes so that they know. And this is the last thing he writes. So this is his most developed thought. It's long. He is very detailed. Paul thinks in, he doesn't think in complete sentences. He, he thinks in complete paragraphs. It's really hard to read sometimes. But if you look at the last chapter of the last book that he writes, let, let me read it to you. I commend to you our sister Phoebe, a deacon of the church in Sencre, so that you may welcome her in the Lord as fitting for the saints and help her in whatever she may require from you. For she has been a benefactor of many and of myself as well. Greet Prisca or Priscilla and Aquila who work with me in Christ Jesus, who risked their, ni- risked their necks for my life, to whom not only I give thanks, but also all of the churches of the Gentiles. Greet also the church in their house. Greet my beloved Eponitus, who is the first convert in Asia for Christ. Greet Mary, who has worked very hard among you. Greet Andronicus and Junia, my relatives who were in prison with me. They are prominent among the apostles, and they were in Christ before I was. Who are most of the people in that list? Women. All right. Let's look at how how Paul talks about him. Our sister Phoebe, a deacon. What was the first position of authority created by the apostles in Acts? Deacons, right? The first position of authority of leadership in the church was the diaconate. And here is Phoebe, who is being named as a deacon. Help her in whatever she needs, because she's good. And she is serving the church at Senecre. Priscilla and Aquila, a woman who works with Paul. Mary, who has worked very hard among you. And then it is this last verse that really is the essential one here. Because it talks of Junia. Not a common name today, but that is a woman's name from the first century. In all of our records, there's not a single time that's been used as a man's name. This is a woman in the first century. And what is her status? What is her position? They are prominent among the apostles. 
What is Paul's status? When Paul signs off his name, what does he call himself? An apostle of Jesus Christ. There is no higher position that a person can have in the church than apostle. And it's not like, maybe she's just an apostle for women, right? She is the apostle, how, how do you phrase it? They are prominent among the apostles. She is a great leader among leaders. She's as good as it gets. She was in Christ before I was. She is a mother of the church, a leader among leaders, and she's good, right? So what do we do with passages like 1 Timothy? I can tell you what I do. I see it as one moment along the way when Paul is writing down the best advice he could to a church that was in conflict, to a young leader who needed to figure out what mattered most, and Paul's just trying to help Timothy get through. It's advice that did not line up with what Paul had said elsewhere, but sometimes theory is great and you just got to get through. I see this as something that Paul grew to understand very differently because of what I read in the Bible, and especially in Romans, the last chapter that Paul writes, being his most developed thought. I see Paul as someone who had to figure out the practical advice for the churches that were in the middle of conflict, all the while he was continuing to grow and learn himself and what it means to follow Jesus in all aspects of life. And that in the end, Paul sees that what it means to say that we are all one in the body of Christ, that male or female is less important than the fact that we are in Christ together, leads him to be able to praise, affirm, support, and celebrate women in ministry, including such women as Phoebe, Priscilla, Mary, and Junia. Not just one or two, but women serving across all parts of the leadership of the church, from deacons to the highest position, an apostle. When the Bible seems hard to read, I think this is how we respond. We don't ditch it. We don't try to blindly apply it. I think we zoom out and get the whole story, because it is in getting the whole story that we can see what makes Paul so amazing. It's not that Paul was perfect. It's that Paul, in following Jesus, was transformed. And that is the promise we have as well. God loves you just the way you are, and God's not done with you yet. We have much, each of us, to learn and to grow as we follow him. Thanks be to God. Amen.